Hello, hello, hello. <coughs> good evening. It's good to see you all here this evening. Oh, hey. There we go. <laughs> hey, it's good to see you all. Good to see everybody this evening, and it's about time for us to get started. Hope everyone is having a good week. Okay, I'm figuring this thing out here. There we go. I hope everybody is having a good week so far. Uh, it's been a beautiful week and that lovely first day of fall that we've uh, had yesterday. And here we are in the season of autumn. It's so hard to believe that this year has gone by as quickly as it has. And we are fast approaching the last quarter. Uh, we've all spent, it seems like most of this year, holed up, hiding from uh, corona and maybe wanting to hide from all the politics that's going on. And it's been quite a stressful year. But you know what? Nothing that's happened this year has taken the Lord by surprise. And so we serve him. He is awesome. And it is wonderful to get to be here tonight uh, with each and every one of you as we gather here to worship and Bible study one more time, at least online. And hopefully soon within uh, the next uh, near future, we'll be able to move back to having this together in person again as well. Well, before we get started tonight with our Bible study, let's go over our prayer list and I'm going to pass along some prayer requests and some updates to you. And as I've been saying every week, I do want to remind you that you can get this prayer sheet delivered directly to your inbox on your email account. If you'll just go to macedoniabaptist.church, uh, that is our website. There's a place on there you can sign up and put your information in. And Judy will send this directly to you. And you can have it there on your phone, your device. Oops, there we go, there we go. <clears throat> you can have it on your phone your device with you at all times. Uh, it's just some updates and some prayer lists, that prayer needs that we have. And on here today, I want to remind you to be in prayer for Awanas as we're looking to kick that off. And man, it'll be here before we know it. On October the 14th, that's when the kids come back uh, after fall break in, the, in our school system here locally. And so we're looking to kick that off, be in prayer for that ministry as we start back up after a long, long layoff because of Corona. Uh, we need a few things. One, we need a, a worker or two to help with this. And if you have any questions at all, we encourage you to contact the church office and we will be glad to put you in touch with whoever we need to, to <clears throat> so that you can find out what we might need. We also need Germex, Lysol wipes, and Lysol spray. And if you are able to contribute any of that for our uh, Awana effort, we would surely would appreciate that. As we're going to be using a lot of that stuff uh, to keep our rooms clean during this time. So we'll be cleaning everything as soon as everybody leaves and before everybody comes. And so we're going to go through a lot of the cleaning supplies. So if you can help with that, it will be greatly appreciated. A couple of prayer requests to pass along. And we've been praying for Kevin Mendoza, who's a young first grader with uh, bone marrow cancer. We need to keep praying for him as he's going through his chemo treatments. Uh, Tony Helisek, who is Gene Helisek's son. Many of you are familiar with Gene here from our church. Tony had a, a serious motorcycle accident, and he's been in a very serious condition, very uh, gravely injured, but they were able to do some reconstructive surgery on him. And he, uh, on his, uh, to several places, his face, his pelvis, he's had a lot of work done. He was downgraded from critical care and ICU and put into a regular room and he is being responsive and so he's coming along and we want to continue to pray for Tony. He's got a long recovery ahead of him. And uh, Gene and the family wants to tell everyone thank you uh, for the prayers so far and please continue to keep them in your prayers. Also, we were praying for Frankie Clement, who is the worship leader over at Farmland Community Church. Frankie's been very ill, but he was able to come back to church uh, this past Sunday, and so we're uh, glad to see that he is improving and continue to keep him in your prayers. Farmland is where our dear Judy Atkinson uh, goes to church, and so we just remember them. Also remember to keep the Corbins in prayer, and uh, Miss Diane Vaughn, who is Judy's uh, sister, she is still uh, has a follow-up appointment with her heart doctor coming up in the first part of October, and we need to continue to pray for her. Again, we encourage you to send in any prayer requests that you have and you would like to have passed along. We'll be glad to do so on this forum. 
Uh, we we will do it if you say it's okay to share it publicly. These these that I'm sharing have been passed along for public sharing, so we don't want to do anything that would make you uncomfortable. But if you want the church to pray, send that in to us either by email or by phone, or you can do it through Facebook. Uh, this format we're doing right here, and uh, we'll be glad to pass that along. Also remember to continue to pray for Willie Brackett, who is fighting lung cancer that has metastasized and gone through other parts of his body. And so we need to continue to pray for him as well. Well, let's pray. And then we will uh, dive into our uh, study here tonight. One more way. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that we can come here today. Lord, we do pray for all these ones that we have listed on our prayer list, Father. They're not just names. They're, they're people in situations who, Father, many are frightened and many are hurting. And Lord, we just lift them up to you for comfort and strength. Father, some are very ill, and we just lift them up to you for healing. Father, all need a touch from you in some way. And so, Lord, we just uh, can just commit them to you in this time. And Father, for those who are in our paths, who you put in our path, help us, Father, to be the hands and feet of Christ to them, to show them your love in this time as they walk through. Let them know they're not alone. And help us to, to show them, Father, that, that they are loved. Father, we pray for the Wannis program as we get ready to start it back. For each heart that will be touched. Father, for each one that will work. And Father, for each family that will be affected. Lord, we just pray that your spirit would fall even in these uncertain times, Lord. And just lead us, Father, into sharing your truth with this next generation. And Lord, we just pray you'd be with us tonight as we open your word. Father, speak to our hearts as only you can in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, it's good to be back. We're looking here at Jonah again tonight. We are in the first chapter of Jonah. We're going to start reading about verse 10 here tonight. As we <clears throat> looked at Jonah last week and we, you know, talked about Jonah being God's rebellious child. You know, and there's some things that God's rebellious children learn. You know, we learn that God's in control. Jonah tried to run. What did God do? Sent the storm to turn him around. Jonah thought he would call the shots. God said, no. Let me show you how this is going to work. Uh, God's rebellious child learns that there's nowhere to, you can't rest. I mean, Jonah was trying to sleep in the boat. And, well, you know, the, his plans got upset. Uh, he was forced into this storm. And you cannot remain silent. And that's where we ended last week. God's re, even God's rebellious children ultimately have to own who they are. And we saw that in verse 9 where Jonah said to the sailors, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And so even God's rebellious children at some point find that we can't remain silent and we have to own who we are. Well, we're going to continue in this vein as we start down here into verse 10 tonight. And, you know, we're reminded about being God's rebellious children. And that's kind of, you know, sometimes we may think that, oh, I'm not a rebel. I, you know, I don't really reject God, but, you know, sometimes we're just God's disobedient children. Maybe we don't think we're an outright rebel, but we just disobey. We're not going to do what God has called us to do. And so anyway, this is where we find Jonah. He's rebelling. He's disobedient. And unfortunately, I find all too often that he reflects me more than I want to admit. And especially as we look at these next few verses here tonight. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 10. If you are a disobedient child of God, and we all are at times, if you've been disobedient or you're disobedient right now, I want you to know that, that God loves you. Jonah was disobedient, and God had took some strong uh, steps to get his attention, but God did so because he had not given up on Jonah, and God has not given up on you as well. But there are some lessons that we need to learn if we're disobedient, and we all are at times, and one is that disobedient children of God are a very big part of the world's problem today. Now, we may not be very comfortable with that, we want to look around and blame the world. We want to blame Hollywood. We want to blame Washington. We want to blame our sinful neighbors down the street for the mess that society is in and the storms that are raging around us. But quite often, 
if the children of God would just be about doing what God has called us to do, you know what? The world around us would not be in such a mess as it is. Let's read verses 10 and 11. It says, The men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to them, what should we, they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. Well, Jonah was in rebellion against God. He, God said, go to Nineveh and preach to those people. Jonah said, I do not want to. Right down to the sea he went booked passage on the first ship he could find, heading in the exact opposite way, and there he went. God sent a mighty storm, and in the middle of this storm, Jonah was hauled up out of his rest in the lower parts of the boat of the ship, and as all the sailors were crying out to their gods, and all of the uh, uh, people on board were in panic mode, they began to cast lots, and they began to see why is this storm come upon us? And the lot fell to Jonah. And they said, okay, Jonah, tell us what's going on here. That's where we talk in verse 9. Jonah said, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God who made the earth and the dry land and the sea. And so then you get down there to verse 10, and it says, after he told them that he feared the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land, the men became extremely frightened then. And they said to him, how could you do this? And now, you know, like I said earlier, we want to blame everyone in the world, Hollywood, Washington, uh, our substance abusing neighbors, you know, the people that we don't like down the street, those who have immoral lifestyles for the decline of society. But the fact of the business is a lot of the storms in society have come upon us because the children of God have been rebellious and disobedient, and we have not gone and proclaimed the truth that God has called us to proclaim. We've been more interested in our own comfort and in our own business, and instead of following God wholeheartedly, we decided we, like Jonah, would go in our own direction. But Jonah's rebellion brought trouble upon the ship and upon the other people in the ship. See, this, this Jonah wasn't the only person involved at this time. God was getting Jonah's attention, but to get Jonah's attention, it brought trouble on everyone around Jonah. That storm wasn't just raining on Jonah's head. That rain wasn't just pouring in, in Jonah's boots. That wind wasn't just blowing on Jonah. It was blowing on everyone, and everyone began to see that they were in trouble, and everyone began to try to fix this trouble as best as they could. You know, that's what happens. When we are sinful, our sin is never contained just to us. It affects all the people around us. Sin will cause storms in our life. Sin will bring unrest and, and disquiet into our lives that never stops just with us. It affects those around us, our families, our coworkers, our friends, our neighborhoods even. We can't think that we can just go on and disobey God and do what we feel and everyone around us not be affected in some way. Because if God is pursuing us, God will use some drastic measures to get our attention. And the people around will begin to notice and maybe even begin to worry. Because even lost people recognize sin when it's in God's children. Have you ever noticed that? Look how these guys in, in uh, verse 10, they said, how could you do this? Jonah. Now, these guys were not Hebrews. They were not worshipers of Yahweh. They were pagan sailors. And yet they ch chided Jonah for running away from Yahweh. How could you do this? What were you thinking, Jonah? You should have known better than this. How can you run from your God? I think what was probably behind that was they were saying, we would know better than to run from our God. How could you run from your God? He's not going to take that calmly. But also, another way to rightly translate this or to see the, the, the spirit in which this is said is not just to say, how could you do this? But to say, how could you do this to us? How could you have brought this trouble on us with your rebellion to your God? Now your God is chasing you and he's going to take us down with you. That's what these guys are saying. You, Jonah, are the cause of the trouble. You, Jonah, who are so pious. You, Jonah, who are better than us. 
You are the cause of our threat and our danger. You know, like I said, the condition of society around us is not the fault of Hollywood or Washington. They are merely reflections of the society that are around us. Hollywood doesn't cause the problems. Washington doesn't cause the problems. They reflect the problems. It's a, a huge part of the problem is that the children of God are being disobedient and not shining our lights and living our lives the way that we're called. If just all the people who claim to be Christians in this nation lived a committed Christian life, we would see prison populations rapidly decline. We would see poverty begin to be eradicated. We would not see one hungry child and the homeless population would have an incredible uh, dent made in it simply because the children of God would be spreading the hope that we're called to spread. Jonah wasn't going to offer that hope in his day, and it began to bring problems for those around him. And we're all too often guilty of the very same thing in ours. Well, you know, it, it hurts to think we might be part of the problem. To look down the street and see the addiction and see the broken homes and to see the wreckage that is in our societies and think, am I part of that problem? Have I withheld truth? Have I not spoken when I should have? Have I not stood up? Well, it can be uh, very discouraging to think that. But I want to give you an encouraging word because God uses then, even though we can oftentimes be part of the problem, God will use his rebellious children, his disobedient children, when they surrender to be part of the solution. Let's look at verse 12 and four through 14. So Jonah said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. And I, for I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. And they called on the Lord and said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. And do not put innocent blood on us, for thou, O Lord, has done as you have pleased. Well, Jonah finally surrendered. You see that? He said, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm, for I know on account of me this great storm has come upon you. Jonah finally surrendered. But interestingly, he didn't really surrender to God's will, but he did surrender to God's judgment. He had not surrendered to God's will yet. He still wasn't ready to go to Nineveh at this point. He still didn't want to do what God told him to do, but he did surrender to God's judgment. He said, God's judgment and his wrath have come upon you because of me. So throw me into the sea and then it will be okay for you. Jonah does show some noble qualities here. I, I, you know, we beat Jonah up a lot. Jonah gets taken to task a lot, but I, you know, he's more of a positive model than we give him credit for often. Even Christ in the New Testament speaks of Jonah in a positive light. And so as we look at this, we need to understand that Jonah is someone who does believe wholeheartedly in God. Jonah is someone who was an effective prophet in his day. He's someone who has kind of slipped here. He's not, this is not his finest moment, but we all have those times. But Jonah, when he recognizes what's happening, he says, throw me in, guys. Don't let this, don't go down because of me. Don't die because of my rebellion. Throw me into the sea. God's after me. I will accept his judgment and I will accept his wrath and you can go free. And in this, we see a pretty magnanimous spirit in Jonah. He, he finally did surrender to God, not to God's will, but to his judgment. But the solution seemed way too dreadful to these guys, even to these pagan sailors. In verse 13, it says, oh, they began to row desperately for the land. Evidently, the ship was not too far from land at this time. They, could, they still thought they could get back. And so they began to row desperately, it said. That just sounded awful. Jonah said, throw me in. Everything will be fine. And even these pagan sailors said, oh, that's too terrible of a price. That's, 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 a, that's too bad. We can't do that. That's just too, too drastic. And they didn't want to take that step. And, you know, even pagans know it's wrong to kill and murder for no reason. And they did not want to be held guilty for that. 
I mean, they wanted to do the best thing they could by Jonah. They wanted to look out for him. They said, no, there's no need for that. We'll see if we can save you. And they continued to try to solve this problem in their own strength and in their own wisdom. But ultimately, they realized they had to surrender to God's will as well. They had to surrender. And you saw that in verse uh, 14 where it said, they called on the Lord and they said, and when they called on the Lord, that, that, is, that is Yahweh there in that verse, the name of, of the holy God, the personal name of Israel's God. They called on him, someone whom they were not worshipers of, but they began to see his power and see what was happening in Jonah's life. And they began to call on Jonah's God. And they said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, please don't let us die on account of this man and don't hold his blood against us. Uh, don't let us perish. We don't, don't hold us guilty for killing an innocent man. Now, they would have understood that Jonah wasn't innocent before God, but as far as they were concerned, he was innocent. He hadn't done anything to them that would warrant retribution from them. They began to recognize that all of this was in God's hand, that all of this was at God's instigation. And if they had any hope whatsoever, they had to surrender to God's work and to God's will, even as dreadful as it might sound. And so they picked up Jonah and threw him overboard. They surrendered to God and they prayed for forgiveness. You know, look, there's a picture of salvation here with these pagan sailors. They finally gave up their own efforts trying to save themselves. They finally gave up their own wisdom, trying to make sense of what was happening. And they turned completely and wholeheartedly and called on the name of the Lord. And the Bible tells us all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so in calling on Jonah's God, they showed an act of faith and they trusted his grace. They trusted his goodness and they followed his will and they were delivered from the storm. You know, that's that's basically what salvation is. We trust God's grace. We lean uh, on his mercy and we're delivered from the storm of sin in our life. These men came to salvation because Jonah finally surrendered. I mean, he was indirect. He wasn't the greatest witness, but he was a witness nonetheless. And you and I don't have to be the most eloquent witness. You and I don't have to be the wisest witness. We just have to be willing to surrender. And when we surrender, we become agents of salvation. God can use us to point people to him. It is he who saves, not us anyway. Jonah didn't save these sailors by getting thrown overboard. God delivered them from the tempest after they followed his will. And that's all we need to do as well. And Jesus tells us over in Luke chapter 9, you know, that we are to surrender ourselves to be his disciples. He said, whoever would become my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We surrender wholeheartedly to Christ. Take up our cross. He didn't say we have to learn to speak eloquently and we have to get uh, 15 degrees to hang on the wall. He just said, Take up your cross, surrender your life, and start following me. And when we do that, we can become agents, salvation agents that God can use to shine hope and, and, and wisdom and life into this dark and dying world. Well, there's one last thing I want to leave you with here tonight. We see these guys being saved from the storm. And so salvation was coming out of this boat, but salvation only comes, and this goes along with the surrender part. Salvation only comes through God's ordained process. Look at verse 15. They picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Well, the sailors were desperate. They had tried everything. They had thrown the cargo overboard. They had rowed as hard as they could row. They had fought the wind and the waves until they got to a point of desperation where they had no choice but to turn to Jonah's God. And in turning to Jonah's God and in doing what Jonah's God asked of them, they found that they were delivered. Not through anything they did, not through their wisdom, not through their power, not through their strength, but through God's ordained 
process. Jonah said, throw me out, boys, and it'll be okay. They did, and it was. The ship would not have survived any other way. The sailors were desperate, and they turned to the only option that God would allow at that time for their deliverance. You see, this is how it is with salvation. God allows one thing. God ordains salvation his way. We oftentimes are like these sailors. We want to try to be in our own strength. We're going to row ourselves through the storm. We're going to do our own wisdom. We're going to call on the gods that we know. But God only allows deliverance in one way. God rescued the sailors when Jonah surrendered to judgment and when they surrendered to his will. God then worked in all of their lives to show he was a God who could save. You know, now, Jonah, at this point, was becoming a salvation agent, even though he was one of the, we might call him the worst evangelist ever, in a way. He's, 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 he's selfish. He's rebellious at this time. He's not really presenting the truth. And yet, yet, God works through him. If we surrender, even when we're rebellious, even when we're disobedient, God can still use us to bring people to him. And I want you to know tonight that God has ordained salvation through one process and one alone. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. There are many people who feel that this is just too exclusive. There has to be another way. There has to be something else. Uh, that feel that it's too dreadful, that God would actually execute a person for the sins of everyone else. It seems like a dreadful thing. It seems too dreadful to accept. It seems like uh, it's too illogical to accept. But God has ordained the process this way. Figuratively speaking, we throw Jesus to God's wrath. Like the sailors threw Jonah, into the sea to God's wrath and judgment. We throw Jesus into God's wrath and judgment, and he calms that wrath and judgment for us, and nothing else will do. Nothing else that we try will suffice. God has ordained it through one process, and it may seem dreadful, it may seem illogical to us, but it is the only way. And those aren't my words tonight, folks. Those are words directly from Scripture, and I stick on that, and that's where my hope is. No matter how rebellious we are, no matter how disobedient we do at times, you know, God still loves us, and he doesn't give up on his rebellious children. So there's still work for us, y'all. We can still be salvation agents, even if we've been poor witnesses up to now. Surrender to God's will. Surrender to God's judgment and say, Lord, just have your way with me. Whatever it takes, use my life in some way to share peace and light and hope with this community. A boatload of sailors walked away worshiping the Lord than someone they had never known before, even uh, just because they knew a disobedient prophet named Jonah. And hopefully someone will walk away from us knowing the Lord even if we're not the best witness at that time, it still gives us hope. Well, I want to thank you for being here tonight. And I hope everyone has a good night, good week, the rest of the week. And I look forward to seeing you right back in our sanctuary here, 3119 Spring Place Road here in Cleveland, Tennessee, at Macedonia Baptist Church. We will be here for our worship at 10 o'clock Sunday morning. And uh, hopefully soon, we will be getting back together on Wednesday nights as well in person, but we will also keep broadcasting on Facebook Live for those who can't be there or who health or life situations prevent that. So you can still join us on this forum as well. Thank you for being here tonight. I look forward to seeing you. God bless you and good night.